Welcome to Business Conversations with your host, business strategist, Clive Enivar. Clive is joined by expert guests as they talk business behind the scenes to give you the tools and insights to support your growth, security and serenity as you strive for your success. Good morning and today we're talking with Stephen Brown of Etienne Law. Now, Stephen Brown is a lawyer who helps business uh, people keep out of trouble. As the law is not neatly compartmentalised, Stephen has the ability, knowledge and experience to bring together all the areas needed for business people to get their issues resolved. Business is all about conversations and communication. Stephen, tell us about a business conversation that influenced you to do what you do. A client of ours um, is called Coppers and they they do the Coppers, the the logs, the Mm -hmm. um, logs that are impregnated and We've worked for them for a number of years and we'd sort of lost contact for a while. And then the uh, general manager contacted us uh, or contacted me and asked if we could have a meeting and we had a meeting and I was speaking with him and he said, look, um, the parent company had been asking to use a larger law firm but... um, they had discovered that by using the larger law firm, every time they had a problem, they would go back to the last person they spoke to. And that person might have been the intellectual property. And the new issue that they had was employment law. So they yeah. would be pushed to someone else. And then they would have to explain who they were and how they acted and what their risk return profile was with the new person. And so every time they had an issue, they kept on seeing new people who didn't understand them or their needs. And they said, look, when we worked with you, you understood everything about our business. And if you couldn't precisely help us, you were able to put it onto the right people. But we worked with you in in a partnership because you understood where we were. And because we're um, not as big as BHP, when we saw you, you gave us the attention that we needed and deserved. Whereas when we go to the bigger firms, we're, we're not as large a client to them and we get pushed around a bit. So can we come back? And we said, of course we can. <laughs> uh, Indeed. So That was a bit of a so, no-brainer. But, uh, <laughs> so essentially it's, uh, it's about um, being able to help somebody across the all the areas that they want help and yeah. i'll take this opportunity now to let people know how i met Stephen, because about a decade ago and and this goes into what Stephen was just saying because uh he's exceptionally thorough and i discovered this because i was working away uh on a particular project that i had at the time at about ten thirty at night and the phone rang through my 1300 number and on the other end was Stephen. And he, he asked me a few questions about a particular site that were, was out there and it sounded a little bit more than just an ordinary potential customer. And on questioning him, I found out that he was researching things. So here I am, 10.30 at night and a lawyer is researching things. So since then, of course, I've discovered that uh, Stephen researches every dash thing that he can possibly get his eye on. And I'm pretty sure he does that because uh, it's all about his upbringing and everything. Before we get into serious business conversations about law, Stephen, tell us a little bit about Stephen. Well, um, I I suppose... Well, not suppose. I, re- I really have. I, I see the role as being a lawyer as a vocation, as as opposed to being a job. And so, for me, uh, I don't need to have a work life balance because a vocation is your life. So, whatever I do, it's either part of work or not part of work. So, when I'm um, off at a restaurant, I'm still living my life. So I don't have to worry about this work-life balance. Um, So many lawyers that I've seen who try to have the work-life balance uh, end up in divorce because 
they, they try to departmentalise too many things. Um, mm-hmm. And I suppose I have a very loving and patient wife who um, puts up with all this and um, it also helps that she's an indentured slave to the practice. <laughs> she, like and I, um, works in the same sort of environment. So um, that, that's obviously very useful. So Indeed, and and of course, uh, Stephen's now talk, talking about Suzanne, who who also brings particular skills to the business. <laughs> very much, very much so. Couldn't do without it. Indeed. So, and it, that that of course uh, runs across what we're talking about here: business conversations. You're you're having business conversations all the time. Business does run into personal, and personal runs into business. And it's important to understand the difference, but sometimes they do um, run across each other. Mm. Very much so. Fun. Let's get right into it. No, before we get right into it, I want to bring up one other thing. Stephen operates out of uh, his office in Sydney, and um, one could be forgiving, forgiven for thinking perhaps that uh, he's just a suburban lawyer. I recently had occasion to discover that uh, Stephen had been invited to, uh, was it Geneva or Vienna? Where, where uh, were you? St. Petersburg one year and Venice the next. And what were you doing in each of those two places? Um, I was asked by the Federation of International Patent and Trademark Attorneys to discuss um, one in St. Petersburg we were doing the search and seizure requirements and provisions under the Trademarks Act for piracy of uh, pirated trademark goods. So Louis Vuitton, um, Ubisoft, um, Pierre Cardin, things of this nature. So when someone's ripping them off, what actions the actual trademark owners can take. And then mm-hmm. next year we were doing trademark valuation methodologies and how they work for businesses and in particular startups. So essentially, you you operate in an international world. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the the benefit of, of the firm that we've got is that um, I've been in a very large firm or a number of large firms, and um, I've also, as part of that, lectured um, at the doctorate and masters levels in companies and securities law, and we we have a, a broad range of areas, and we've discovered that to help. Startups, um, small um, SME businesses, you, you need to have a vast range of skills, just like the business person needs mm-hmm. to get their heads across marketing, accounting, finance, uh, employment. We, as their lawyer, need to assist them with employment, intellectual property, the finance requirements, the corporation's requirements, the, and, and particular legislation that they may need with um, in, environment. Uh, Some people need particular licensing, uh, liquor licensing with restaurants and hotels. They have their own niche areas. And if we can't pinpoint and spotlight for a client the areas of risk, then we're no use to them. And the the bigger firms we find with their experts um, have the difficulty that they don't know enough of the broad range to be able to point uh, a client into the right direction and thereby keep them out of trouble. There we are. So there's a, there's a lot of, uh, well, thinking along the lines of uh, there's stuff that you don't know that you don't know. Exactly. And I think that's the, 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 the greatest problem, that, um, that ignorance of the law is no excuse. Uh, we've probably all heard that adage. And... That adage, though, is true. Um, there was um, a case um, of Ostrowski, and Mr. Ostrowski was a cray fisherman in WA. He was a commercial fisherman. And he went to the fisheries in WA and said, look, where can I, where can I and where can't I fish? And so they gave him some maps, and he was fishing in the areas that he was told that he could crayfish in, only then to be penalised by another department or a sub-department of the fisheries. Yeah. And he said, well, hold on, you know, I've been, I went to your department, I was told I can fish here, um, there, there shouldn't be a problem. 
and um, he was penalised. Um, he went to court and he was uh, found to have breached the law. But he said, my defence is I was doing the right area. I was told I could fish here. And the court said, no, you were not in the right area. Yes, the department gave you wrong advice, but you haven't pleaded that as an, an issue. Therefore, we're going to penalise you. And the matter went as far as the High Court. And um, the High Court regrettably said, uh, whilst we feel for you, uh, you have done the wrong thing. Yes, you can't rely upon the department because nothing was in writing. Uh, you didn't even raise it as a defence, so it's too late to raise it in the appeal. So the, the poor guy got penalised. So <laughs> it's, it's, you, you've got to be so careful. And it's what you don't know, even if you try to do the right thing, if you haven't, like, if you hadn't gone to a lawyer and if a lawyer had have told him that and the lawyer was wrong, then the lawyer, their professional indemnity insurance could have kicked in and he could have been sued. Or at least uh, he could have sued the lawyer and he got, he got his protection. Because yes. he went to the department directly, he doesn't have that defence. Um, yeah, right so not knowing what you don't know is a real problem, <laughs> especially for business people. Which brings us to having these conversations because uh, when we start out in business, there's probably uh, a handy time to go and see somebody. And we, we come to that specific thing later. But what's the, is there a, gen, a way that you can describe for our listeners uh, a, a general definition, if you like, of Ignorance of the law is no excuse. Um, yeah, I, the, way, the way I try to describe it to people is that being in business <clears throat> that is like work, walking through a minefield. There are these legal and accounting and even business minds scattered through the field of commercial endeavour that you're traversing. And if you haven't had someone pinpoint and spotlight where the areas of risk are that are more likely than not for mines to be placed, you can inadvertently in your meanderings step on a mine. Stepping on that particular mine either results in you being severely wounded, which has severe detrimental impact upon your cash flow, or it mortally wounds the business thereby killing you through bankruptcy or insolvency and, uh, from which you never recover. Consequently, what we see as important is that it's better for a person in a startup to see us at the beginning so we can highlight their areas of concern, show where the risks potentially are, so that they can avoid those areas, or at least if they're a more, if they're a risk taker, be aware of them so that they can, in an informed way, decide whether they'll take that risk or not. Now, <laughs> what I was going to say is that one of the things that we do do uh, to assist small businesses is that our firm has a kickstart business package. And the Kickstart business package allows business people to engage us on all their business matters for a period of 12 months with no fees being paid during that 12-month period. Um, any government fees or charges, uh, company incorporations or stamp duty for the establishment of any form of protective trust, the client must pay. But our legal fees, we subordinate for a 12-month period. And at the end of that 12 months, the client then has the option of either paying it off by 12 equal monthly instalments and or giving a 7% of their gross revenue um, to kingdom come. Now, obviously, we don't really want to be tied up with clients that way, and, but that's the, the um, disincentive so that they actually pay us off over that period. And the reason we do this is because we know that startups do not have 
in most cases, the sufficient money to have or build the correct legal platform to do the landmine research for them. They don't Indeed. So you're actually uh, ensuring that they have the best possible advice about uh, decisions that they're going to need to make or must make before they even start in some cases uh, to give them the greatest opportunity for success because you're essentially uh, saying that you you see the benefit of what they want to do. We, we, want, we want clients that we work with over the years and we want clients that are out of trouble, not in trouble. So if we can give them correct employment contracts from day one, if we can give them correct terms and conditions, if we can give them correct website usage terms and conditions, if we can ensure that their intellectual property is fully and adequately protected, if we make sure that they've got asset protection trusts if they need it, if they have require shareholders agreements, that if all those things are put in place, then the business will have the strong platform from which to launch itself, whereas we find so many businesses that don't do that uh, meander on for three or four years, uh, they may hit on a real gold mine only to then stumble upon a mine field which then explodes in front of their face and their cash flow is destroyed uh, by having to spend out huge amounts in legal uh, fees for a work health and safety investigation or a border force investigation because they employed uh, people outside the six-month period uh, for uh, work mm -hmm. holiday visa people. It's just so many things that people don't know about. Indeed, and uh, you, you, you're highlighting something that uh, the Australian Bureau of Statistics highlights, which is uh, if we look back to their figures of 2017, they had there were 2.24 million businesses in Australia, 65% of which fail within the first three years, mm. which is a, a pretty horrendous figure. But you uh, identified just a, a moment ago uh, how some of that happens because we we get into business without necessarily knowing uh, all the pitfalls. We don't put in place the right procedures and processes. Uh, at some stage, it's likely to trip us up. Absolutely. Um, and, and, and most people generally do start business. Um, I think many, many people succeed in business not through what they know, but through good luck. And, yes. and because they've succeeded through good luck, they therefore think, oh, well, I won't worry. I don't need to know anymore. Uh, they, they, they basically shut their eyes to the, the problems, stick their head in the sand and hope that the steamroller will bypass them as opposed to rolling them over. And, and as you pointed out, Clive, you know, 65% um, of businesses in the first three years do fall over. Uh, I think the other statistic is that 90% of startups fall over in the first 12 months. So, so it, it's only 10% then only um, mm. fall over in the next two years. So of that 10%, a, a great 65% of them, uh, 6.5 out of the 10, also fall over in the, in the following two years. So very few businesses get through the first three-year period. And um, it's because of the inadvertence of not knowing what you don't know. Absolutely right. And, uh, of course, hopefully here we're providing some information which will help people you know, make the choice to find out first. Because at the end of the day, always been my experience to discover that uh, getting it right before you start costs a heck of a lot less than not getting it right before you start and mucking up after you start. Well, exactly right. And <laughs> and that was the, the point um, I made um, with, with um, you know the, the company with Coppers, um, uh, other companies that we act for, these large companies know through history and experience that it is better to pay a little bit of legal fees up front to have the highlight, have the pitfalls highlighted to them rather than blindly going in ignorance and having them blow up in their face. So oh, in, much cheaper. Indeed. Um... You know, one of my favourite sayings is, uh, what is, is. 
and what is really doesn't matter. What matters is how we react to what is. So if we actually know what is, we can take appropriate action and uh, in most cases, um, <laughs> forewarned is forearmed, we, we avoid the pitfalls. And Absolutely. And I suppose the other thing to do is, is to look at this from, from the way the law is. Uh, and I'm not trying to be disingenuous in saying this, but the law is about a lot of the time structure. Mm. Um, for instance, there's a thing called um, third line forcing in um, the Competition and Consumer Act. And if party A dealing with party B says, I will only deal with you, party B, if you, party B, take goods or services from party C, mm. that is known as third line forcing because A is forcing B to take the goods or services of C. However, if A structures the arrangement in such a way that says, A, when I provide the services, I do it in this manner, and the manner in which the services are provided, you A uses C, A then pays C rather than requiring B to pay C, the same practical result is achieved, but the law is not breached. Now, In, indeed. So there, yeah. there's there very often there's very simple ways of, of overcoming what appears at first glance a complex situation. Correct. And, and whereas <clears throat> as a lawyer, I'm legally able to structure that the correct way for a client. However, if the third line forcing were to arise and a client came to me and said, I've been involved in third line forcing, what can I do about it? As the offence has already occurred, I can't help them anymore. I can only tell them that the penalty will be a maximum of $10 million or the profit which was gained from the contravening behaviour or 30% of last year's revenue, whichever is the greater. Which is rather substantial compared to what would have been your initial fee. <laughs> Absolutely. So <coughs> even a few thousand dollars is a hell of a lot cheaper than having to defend uh, at, at, at what could at the minimum be a $10 million fine. $10 million, 10 million is, is the lower level. <laughs> and, and every day that they're third line forcing, it's not the offence over the period, it's per day. Oh. So, so the, the fines can be astronomical. Indeed. And all because, uh, or well, in many cases, because somebody stumbled across something that they didn't know they didn't know. Yep. So how can business people avoid stumbling and falling across a law that they don't know anything about? Well, um, uh, without taking my tongue out of my cheek, the uh, easiest way is to come and see uh, a competent law firm. Um, obviously, we would recommend coming to see us, um, having regard to the Kickstart package that we, we offer, um, which is a benefit to all new businesses. And that, that stick Kickstart package is available to any person that we've not previously used. So if someone's mm -hmm. been in business or they've, even if they've been in business 15 years, if they're a new client to us and they wish to avail themselves of that particular opportunity, then uh, that's something that we offer to any new business to us. So they don't have to be a new business per se. If they don't wish to use um, our firm, then uh, seeing any lawyer. But um, what we try to do is provide business legal advice. We're, we're there as a business advisor advising of, well, you can do this and if you, these are the options, these are the penalties. If you allow us to restructure it this way, you may, as in the third line forcing example, be able to achieve the same commercial result, but this is the way you need to structure it. So we, we like to, and that's what we enjoy. We like working with business people to get a result. It's proactive. It's when they're trying to achieve rather than being, the defensive when a fine's already hit their desk. Indeed. And do you, you, I think the important thing you mentioned in there was uh, people should see a competent lawyer. Now, 
that's not to knock any lawyer in in saying that but the way to identify a competent lawyer i imagine is to have a decent conversation and through that conversation obviously one has to or should divulge particularly sensitive information in order to find out whether this person is or this firm is capable competent uh, of looking after the issues what what um, oh, what comfort can we take when we talk to a lawyer that the things that we talk about will not end up out in uh, general conversation? Lawyers have an obligation to maintain the confidence and secrecy of anything that is discussed with them, mm-hmm. um, subject to it being a criminal offence. Mm-hmm. Uh, lawyers in Australia, unlike what you see on the television with American lawyers, um, if, you, if, you, if you tell an American lawyer that you've committed murder, then the American lawyer is not obliged to do anything with that um, and indeed can um, act for you, I believe, by you even denying that you've committed the murder, whereas under the English common law system that prevails in Australia, if a client says to a lawyer here, I have done this, uh, breach the law in this particular way, the lawyer cannot then go to court and allow their client to plead not guilty. If the mm-hmm. client in confidence has told them that they've been guilty, the lawyer has to go to court and say that the client is guilty. Uh, the only way they can avoid that is no longer act for that particular client. So provided the client is not disclosing to you criminal offences, then everything else that they they tell us is, is in confidence and we're not um, obliged to disclose it. In fact, it's important for clients to, to realise that if they want to get protection on reports, they should go through a lawyer. We have a thing called legal professional privilege. Now, if a client believes that they might be prosecuted or sued over a particular incident, and that client investigates the incident without going through a lawyer, the material that they uncover is a business record of that firm or business. Mm -hmm. Business records are not subject to legal professional privilege. So if an authority comes along, that information must be disgorged. However, Mm -hmm. if the client believes that there might be a problem, they go to a lawyer and the lawyer says, yes, you may have a problem, and the client then engages the lawyer to investigate it. The lawyer then engages someone to do some reporting, uh, obtains a survey, um, does a workplace investigation on a, an inc- incident of uh, sexual discrimination or racial discrimination. The information which the lawyer either retains or obtains itself or through a third party, is all protected by legal professional privilege. If Mm -hmm. a government authority comes in, that information cannot be disgorged. So using lawyers in this way can be very beneficial to businesses to protect information from having to be disgorged. Indeed. So there's a whole bunch of things that uh, lawyers can actually help with, Uh, not not, uh, restricted to simple advice. Indeed, and uh, you know the as we've been discussing the the legal area is quite a minefield, and there's so much of it. It's so complex. Uh, you do have to be a specialist, essentially, uh, certainly competent, but perhaps a specialist in order to uh, have a good understanding of it to help a business. Because I'm imagining that um, business from your point of view, is very similar to business to my point of view. That is, they they cover such vastly different areas that there are different things that they are likely to run across. Absolutely. Um, Like we, we, um, we have clients that, as I say, um, manufacture or cut down trees, um, impregnate them with chemicals and make telegraph poles and other logs. We have Mm -hmm. clients that have um, cherry farms 
We have clients that uh, are graziers. Uh, we have clients that um, are accountants. We have clients who are patent and trademark attorneys. We have clients who hire around lift equipment. Um, we have clients who are printers, uh, marketing people, business coaches. Mm. So there's a full gamut. And by having worked in this industry for a number of years, we know roughly the areas that of concern for accountants. We know the areas of concern for graziers. And the, and the more you work in the area, the, the more we get this experience that we can impart to the clients. Indeed, and your expertise grows with, uh, with each passing day and, and each new customer. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. It, it, it is a learning on the job process. <laughs> Indeed. So is there a short answer to when is the best time for a business person to see you? Now. <laughs> um, pretty much like the um, yeah, pretty much I gather like the when is the best time to plant a tree yes. 25 years ago that, that's, uh, that's right second that's best right. now yeah that's right yep yeah exactly <laughs> There you go. Look, this has been absolutely great and, and we could talk for hours, I, I know, because we have. Uh, <laughs> but, it's, um, it's much better talking over, over a bottle and glass of red, but there, there we go. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> so let's uh, start moving towards the end of this conversation for this Business Conversation podcast. Yep. What is the best time, uh, the best tip, I beg your pardon, that you have received from our business conversation? Um, the best tip, yeah, actually the, the best tip came from um, a lawyer that I worked with when I first started out. Um, he, he said, if you're not busy, then don't sit around the office, go out and meet people. Mm -hmm. um, and his attitude was that if you were scratching around and looking for work, there's no point in waiting near the telephone or waiting in front of your screen to get the next email. You're better off being out having a coffee or a lunch or engaged in some other activity where you're meeting people who, who by you simply talking to them, you may apprise them of an issue which you then bring in as a job. There so you go. I think, and, and I think that's one of the best tips that I've had. Indeed. So essentially what you're saying is that uh, you know, business is about conversations. Yeah, yeah. Yep. You it's have a conversation and all of a sudden it leads to something else. Correct, yep. Yep. Wonderful things, these conversations. Absolutely. <laughs> What's the top piece of advice you'd like to leave listeners with today? The top piece of advice that I'd like to leave listeners with is that you don't know what you don't know and mm -hmm. it is worth paying a lawyer to give you that insurance that you've got all the information that you do know to keep you out of the minefield or at least if you have to be in the minefield away from the mine or the areas where mines are more likely to be than not. Excellent. Most importantly, let's, let's finish up on this one. How can our listeners connect with you to start their own business conversation with you? They can go to our uh, website, which is um, ednlawyers.com.au, or they can uh, phone. Um, there's a 1300 number on the website, or they can phone the office direct on 02884524. 00 and um, ask to speak to Steve Brown. There you go, Steve Brown. That is excellent. But uh, whilst it'll, it'll be on the written material, um, Etienne, how does one spell Etienne? E T I E double N E or Echo Tango India Echo November November Echo, <laughs> um, which I had to learn to do. Because you're right, no one can spell it. <laughs> that, that was possibly a bad choice of, of, of name. But, um, it, it, it came about in that um, the people that were setting up the firm with um, me 
um, 15 or 16 years this year uh, ago, um, we wanted to have a corporate name because we didn't want to have our names of um, Lucas Avignano, Brown, Cassar, um, because we all discovered, having been in, in firms previously, that it was always only the first name. So Alan Allen yeah. Hensley become Allens. Uh, Freehill, Hollingdale and Page become Freehills. Um, uh, K and L Gates just becomes K and L. Um, Colin Biggers and Paisley became CBP. So yeah. we, we always knew that. So we we wanted a name that um, was just one name, so that when people came and went, there was just the corporate ga- name. And we were fumbling about. And I was lecturing uh, the Institute of Company Directors, and I would take the group out for drinks at the end of the session. And I was talking to someone one night who was a bit of a francophile and um, I, I have an interest in, in, in France and their food. And anyway, he wrote me a letter, an email, and it was uh, Cher Etienne, and Etienne is French for Stephen. And um, someone who was joining the firm saw Etienne and asked what it was, and they suggested, why don't we use that as the name? So uh, that's how it came about. There you go. Perfect. Now we can spell it. <laughs> <laughs> but indeed, no doubt they'll be able to find you because you've provided us with some absolutely excellent information. Thank you very much. Those years and years of experience uh, working for others and, uh, as you say, 16 years working in your own firm uh, have obviously delivered tremendous information and uh, I know they've trem- delivered tremendous support to a whole bunch of people because I've even referred people to you and, and they have said very good things about you. That's, that's good. <laughs> and yes, still clients, most of them, so that's great. Excellent. That's what we like to hear, um, people finding uh, a great way of discovering things to protect themselves, keep themselves safe, make their life easier, uh, grow their business without uh, fear, fearing treading on mines. Uh, and continuing to enjoy their business um, and finding their own work-life balance, whatever that might be. Exactly, exactly. There you go. Stephen Brown, Eddie and Law, thank you so much. This has been an excellent conversation and I look forward to chatting with you again if you'll come back and have a further chat. Clive, I I would always love to come back again. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. So I look forward to uh, catching up soon. Thanks for listening to another episode of Business Conversations with Clive Enever. Make sure you subscribe to future episodes via your favourite podcast app and you can find more business resources at cliveenever.com.au.